All right, uh, se session 18B, uh, facilities operation and maintenance, getting more or less, more for less, the benefits of process optimization. We've got Lance Mason, Mason with Brown and Caldwell, gonna show us how to do it. Thank you very much. So I'll try to make this as interesting as possible so we're not counting ceiling tiles. I know it's late in the afternoon, so. Um, Anyways, so one of the things is, is that uh, my cohort who's not allowed, wasn't able to be here, Rick Kelly, he's a process engineer. I'm an operations guy. I'm an operations specialist. Uh, I, I uh, spent many years in operations. So I stayed up at nights worrying about things and going in the middle of the night and those kind of things. And so it's nice collaboration with process engineer and operations. And that's one of the key things that we focus on here. So we're going to talk a little bit about you know, uh, process optimization, but I think we all know what that means. So I'm not going to bore you with these slides on why we do process optimization, because I think y'all want to know what we're doing. That's why you're sitting in the chair here, right? We don't need to know the theory of process optimization. It's not real hard. So as I said, we'll, we'll bypass some of this, but optimization, we're, we're trying to get more out of what we have, basically. And our key focus is we want to do this, believe it or not, I'm a consultant and I'm saying this, we want to do this without significant capital investment, right? Our favorite term, the low hanging fruit, like when I lived in Arizona, it was, it's a dry heat, right? So in optimization, it's a low hanging fruit. That's the, that's the, uh, the phrase that everybody says. So in a sense, that's what we're trying to do. But I think that we found some interesting ways of doing this. And we're going to talk about those, of course. We have chemical use optimization, right? That's pretty straightforward. I mean, are we talking chemicals like phosphorus removal chemicals, right? We want to go to biological, get away from chemical, maybe phosphorus removal. Maybe with some of our dewatering capabilities, we're going to use less chemicals, even disinfection. Aeration, we talk about aeration all the time. We know that's the most significant portion of our cost of operation, right? So, there's really been some interesting things in, in, uh, in aeration and control and some of these benefits that we're seeing. I don't know if y'all saw Jose Jimenez yesterday. Um, he, he was toward the end of the day, but Jose is doing some incredible work with a team of folks uh, in aeration optimization in terms of you have the old fashioned exponential growth where your DO needs to be at two or your nitrification just drops off the face of the earth. He's finding out, well, they are finding out that's not necessarily true. So we can run these plants at lower uh, aeration or uh, DO than the traditional book will tell you. And they're learning that the biomass actually adapts to this. And so your nitrification rates are actually pretty darn good at low DO. And some of the things we've implemented here kind of show that. And it's really exciting stuff. And I think that it's something that we're going to be looking into. But besides the, the DO thing, it relates to our SRT. Our SRT relates to what's the inventory of biomass that we're carrying in aeration. The more of it we have online that we're aerating that's not doing anything, the more money we're throwing out the window again. It's called endogenous demand, right? So uh, also the nutrient optimization, one of the things... We want to walk through the plant with the operators. We want to brainstorm with the operators and we want to use those good old models collaborating with the operations staff to try to verify some of the things that we might see or predict. Capacity optimization. One of the things that I think we all need to really look at is that when you look at a facility O&M manual that has if your SOR is this number, you need to have this many clarifiers online and that's the end of the story, right? I think we're surprised a lot of the times on the way we can push some of this equipment or some of these processes. I was down in a, a plant in Piscataway, Maryland, which is right in the DC area. And they didn't have a choice because they couldn't get their upgrades done in time. They were having some serious issues with hydraulic capacity with nutrient removal, but you would be surprised what their SOR numbers were. And you would say, oh, there's no way you could run a plant like that. They didn't have a choice and it worked out. So what I'm getting at here is we can look at some of these things and try to push things a little, little harder, but
but we have the collaboration of the engineer and the operators, right? So we're not just gonna, let's give it a try, right? We're gonna, we're gonna have an approach to this. So again, not necessarily on paper and traditionally for what we're seeing, SORs and DO numbers from some of the things we've learned in our education through the years in wastewater treatment. We're learning some new things. Boise, Idaho. That's been a uh, very popular subject in all the presentations I've been in. Doing a lot of great things out there. So one of the things involved in the optimization there was the expansion at the Lander Street facility. Uh, they did a, a capacity assessment and you know, like a process reconfiguration to increase capacity with, without major capital investment. Yep, that's a good word. Everybody likes that. Basically, we're not going to spend a lot of money, hopefully. And yes, I'm a consultant saying that, but continued optimization at West Boise for the last 15 years are doing things like clarifier testing. I have some slides showing that, but I want to talk about some other things first because that's simply clarifier modeling, simply. But it tells you a lot of things. And if we have time, we might go back to that. But I think there's some other things we wanted to focus on here. Um, but that was a recent thing they did out in Boise, found some interesting things uh, with this clarifier testing. But we're going to kind of concentrate on the Lander Street WRF, uh, Secondary Treatment Enhancement Project. So let's look at down below here. That's basically what we're showing as far as the treatment process of the picture above, okay? If we look at this, we wanted to look at some different simulations of step feed. That plant I was telling you about down in Mar or down over in Maryland from here, um, they were doing step feed because they didn't have a choice. They were overloaded like crazy. So they had to do step feed in order to meet their permit. What we're looking at here is we're gonna do some different scenarios modeling wise to see what type of step feed scenarios can end up being an optimized process. So the, the typical layout was, um, they just kind of, they fit to the anoxic zones with the PE, the primary effluent at different concentrations. So we're gonna go a little step above that. And this is busy, this is busy for me here, but bear with me. The base is showing us that we have um, the distribution of the DO, right? Our anoxic zone, high DO, right? We, we always, we're always, we're always saying that, okay, out of that anoxic zone, we need to just hammer it with DO, right? We got to get that DO up there. Same with phosphorus removal. After that anaerobic zone, we got to hammer it with DO. We got to get that way on up there. We're finding out things might not necessarily be like that. So in these different scenarios, I'm not going to go through every single one of them, or y'all would definitely be counting ceiling tiles. So we're going to talk about some of them that work the best. And, and keep in mind, this is modeling, okay? So what we do is we do the model, and it gives us an idea that's low-hanging fruit, and then we'll go out and we'll, we'll implement it and see how it works out. So in our different, and, and so these different scenarios were different Concept or different percentages of the step feed going different areas, different DO set points and different zones. And so we had, uh, we had all these different scenarios and what, what we found was, you know, let me go back here, is that number four, uh, number eight, and number 10 were some of the best options that we had. And we'll, we'll talk about what those uh, scenarios are here in a second. But if we look at um, if we look at this graph down here at the bottom, this is what I thought was was pretty interesting. Is that if we're above zero percent here, that's that's the SRT reduction. Okay, so right here, our SRT was reduced. If we're below that zero line, that means we actually had to raise the SRT to accomplish the treatment. So if we think about this, we, uh, our, our effluent phosphorus, our effluent uh, TIN, total organic nitrogen, you can see here, it didn't vary too terribly much with these different scenarios, but in number four, SRT lowered 
Number eight, SRT lowered. Number 10, SRT lowered. We still had good effluent numbers. So let's try them out. So let's, let's think about this for a minute. What's the benefit of that SRT reduction? Well, that's less solids that we have to satisfy with an oxygen demand. That's less biomass we got to keep alive, right? So we, we've looked at the model telling us that we're not jeopardizing uh, water quality, but we've actually decreased the oxygen in some areas and we've decreased the SRT. That's pretty sweet. That's a serious change in energy usage right there. So alternate four, so if you bear with me here, at the, each, at, at, at the end of each step feed zone, um, we increase the DO to 0.5. So what that means is, is that at the step feed, the anoxic zone, remember we said traditionally we want we to hammer that thing. We just put it to 0.5, where normally it was at 0.7 because they kind of extended that. They wanted to kind of extend that anoxic zone a little bit. But right at the end of that anoxic zone, we, we, uh, we raised it to 0.5. Alternate eight, um, we had a larger aerated zone, meaning that we, the, uh, the aeration zone that followed the, uh, the step feed configuration was a little bit longer. And then alternate 10, we front loaded it more, meaning more of a percentage of it went to the first uh, step feed rather than two and three. So these adjustments, well, Sorry, the, uh, the capacity limiting was the nitrification. So we wanna make sure, hey, we, we've done a great job with, uh, with all this lowering the DO, lowering the SRT, but we've gotta make sure we have enough time for nitrification to happen, right? That wouldn't be a good thing if we didn't. So these adjustments can be in implemented without impacting the phosphorus removal or the denitrification. So the thing is, is that this didn't, this didn't demand us to put new blowers in or a new aeration grid or mixers or anything like that. They just changed the step feed arrangement to option four. So the long-term implication, uh, you, have, uh, you, you could have airflow meters to each zone. You could have uh, control valves, you could drop leg, where you could dial this in even more. So, the, uh, the capacity expansion that was received from this was about 1.7 MGD, meaning that they could take 15%, uh, the, the, the capacity, the treatment capacity was extended to basically 1.7 MGD without having to change uh, anything capital-wise. I mean, this was just a process change. So an example of no capital investment we, we got to put a little money in for the modeling, right? We got to put money in for the meetings and collaboration and things like that. But everybody's on the same page with this, and this was just a process change. Okay. Example number two, Pierce County, Washington. So major plan expansion completed in 2016. Optimization efforts implemented, aeration control strategies on-demand chemical flocculation to take the guesswork out of clarifier settling and side stream treatment to streamline and stabilize uh, mainstream operation. So they had the typical aeration control, right? Direct feedback where basically you have uh, two DO probes and you have a set point and it'll open some valves based on what your DO set point is which affects your blower pressure. And so you can see down below there, that was the graphic results of that type of system. Yeah, I'm sure we've all battled this, right? DO control is not as uh, straightforward sometimes as we think it is. So that's not exactly optimized right there, is it? That's kind of up and down DOs. Now, if we have this cascade control, most open valve scenario, where the most open valve means is that whatever your DO signal is at the lowest, that valve opens to 100%, the air distribution valve, that is. 
And so then the other, uh, the other valves will modulate as well, but one of them is gonna be 100% open. And then the blower is controlled on what your target pressure is. So you have kind of two variables going on here, but it, it gives you a smoother DO profile and uh, it can help reduce the risk of filaments, uh, eliminate peaks because it, it can react to the peaks, right? And you're going to result in uh, lower power cost because you're not doing this, right? It's more of a streamline. And also, it reduces your blower cycling wear and tear, sure. So they had, at this facility, they had some problems uh, with the SVI at times. And um, the setability has been variable. They had bulking sludge, which, you know, led to high SVI levels high blankets, which of course reduces your clarifier capacity. The greater your sludge blanket, the lower your hydraulic capacity your clarifier is. Uh, also, they had pin flock problems at times and, um, you know, which lowered the SVI, but they all result in higher TSS, right? So on-demand chemical flocculation kind of puts the operators in control to help out with this so that you can avoid these um, some of these upset conditions. And here's just some nice pictures of our uh, results of some of the testing, you know, where you have a control and then you have which chemical and kind of shows you. I don't think it takes, you know, a lot of thought to figure out that the chemical enhancement can help the settling. And with, with an optimized dose, then we can kind of control the system a little bit better and uh, wouldn't lead to some of the other problems that, that they might be having. Now the side stream treatment, this was, this was interesting where at this facility, um, they didn't necessarily have a, a, a total nitrogen uh, limit on their permit, but the, uh, the, the side stream ammonia was something that needed to be dealt with. And if we look at the system they had, it was the Animox system uh, continuously operated. And so the centrate ammonia concentration was reduced from 1800 to 300. And uh, of course that helps stabilize our MBR or BNR process. Let's take a look at this graph here for a little bit. Now, keep in mind this is over five years here. So a few, few things going on with the, with the startup. And then um, once they got into the uh, the third year there of kind of dialing this thing and you can see that nitrogen just like falls off the tin and so they weren't doing this year round because they didn't they weren't required to but then they started to figure out that hey you know what maybe we should do this year round and you can see over there on the far right that's where they started to do it year round and you can see the numbers came down on the total nitrogen uh, with the side stream treatment so Pueblo, Colorado. This is where uh, Jose, what Jose was talking about yesterday, where they've done some significant uh, modifications out there and process changes, and they're learning some things. So they had a major plant expansion, um, aeration control strategies, hydrocyclone wasting. So just like your hydrocyclone, say with your grit you send your sludge to this hydrocyclone it takes out some of the fuzzy stuff that might be on the top the nice settling larger stuff goes back into the process um, and from these two things they had a side benefit of uh, reduced chemical usage the avn aeration system uh, it's a patented system where Typically, when we would look at our results of total nitrogen, we want zero ammonia and then whatever we can keep our nitrate to, right? This works in a little bit different concept. And some, some facilities have permits where you have to have low nitrogen, or I'm sorry, low ammonia as well as a low total nitrogen. But what this system can do is that it tries to, it, it measures 
the dissolved oxygen, it measures the nitrate, and it measures the ammonia all together, and it comes up with kind of a ratio. So let's say it's three and three and whatever your DO is. And then maybe as your ammonia starts to go up, it'll put more air there. If the, if the nitrite, nitrate starts to go up, then it might take the air down. But we're not trying to shoot for 100% complete nitrification. And so this system, like Jose was talking about, you can run a really low DO throughout your system. And through our previous knowledge or our, our early knowledge, we were like, oh, that's, that's bad news. You know, because if you lower your, if you're, you're below two, then your nitrification rate is going to decrease exponentially. And he showed a curve from the literature that showed this exponential curve. Well, they're finding out is that if you have this low DO set point for our typical, what do say, two to three SRTs, right, to see a difference, that the biomass adapts to that low DO, and then these nitrification rates actually start to kind of go up a little bit. So that exponential curve might show our nitrification rates were like down to 0.2 or 0.3, where actually with this low DO, maybe it's back up to 0 0.6, 0 0.5 or something. It's not as bad. So if we can get the same nitrification rates, which as we talked about before too, lowering that, that SRT, we're going to save a lot of energy and still get the same water quality. So if we look at the graph on the right, basically what that's saying is, is that in the 50th percentile, the DO is like at 0.26. That's really low, right? Half the time, the DO is really low. And then the 90th percentile, not very common, right? On the very end of the bell curve, it's at 0.72. So we're not even a one milligram per liter of DO. And I mean, we don't have to be uh, smart engineer uh, in our calculations to understand the difference between one and two milligrams per liter is a lot of energy, right? So we're learning new things. And some of this data is really showing it. Now, questions about low DO, does it, does it uh, breed filaments? And with that hydrocyclone thing, we're, we're filtering a lot of that stuff out of there. But there might be some, uh, some problems with the low DO filaments. But also, you could address that with a selector. And a selector wouldn't be too terribly much. Might be a capital investment, so I might be lying to you here. We might have a little capital investment. But, um, you know, a selector would help with the filament control. And I think with this DO control or the energy uh, control um, savings, we could buy a selector, no problem. So get this, though. Look at, look at our, our, our bullets down here. So the savings that was realized here, they went down to one blower out of five. Right? And the blower operates at lower air flows. So you, you know, when you take one blower offline, that's a pretty big deal. Take more than one offline, that's an even bigger deal. So there's some real, uh, there's some real savings to be realized. In I'll go quickly through the daft, uh, but they, they had some, uh, some work they did um, on, on testing some of these DAFs to try to optimize some of these, uh, the DAF processes. And they, uh, they were thinking about reinstituting at this facility sludge thickening in the primaries. Um, they were thinking about constructing a new primary sludge thickening unit. And so they figured out that, or we figured out that the DAFs could have some spare capacity. So maybe, Maybe we could start hammering these DAFs a little bit more uh, with the WAS. And so if we look at some of these numbers real quick here, if you look in the middle column, the solids loading rate on these DAFs, and then you look at the solids capture over there, your float densities and your subnatant, right? Your subnatant uh, concentration on the, on the TSS. You can see that the last three there they got hammered pretty well. And the results over to the right, not too bad, especially with the capture. So the, uh, 
it topped out at 77 because the pump couldn't pump anymore. <laughs> so you could actually probably hammer a little bit more. So the experience with the coast thickening showed that we could likely load these DAFs, um, you know, more with, uh, with the sludge loading rates instead of trying to maybe coat thicken in the, in the primaries or uh, build a whole new treatment process. So this was in, we'll go to another part of the United States in Southwest in, in New Mexico. This is just something I wanted to show everybody because sometimes when changes are made operationally, maybe it doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you start thinking and going through things, it makes a big deal. So let's just look at this real quick. This facility has uh, uh, the headworks here, and then they have an EQ basin there at the bottom there, and there's an EQ inlet valve. And so that EQ basin was just designed for loading, hydraulic loading and, and, and ammonia loading to divert, you know, shave off some of these peaks. Well, the valve didn't work very well, and it got stuck open, basically. And so the operator said, you know what? No big deal, because there's pumps in these EQ basins, right? So we'll just let all the flow, instead of fixing this thing, we'll just let all the flow go into the EQ basin. And then we can pump, we could be at steady state all the time. We can just pump whatever rate from the uh, EQ to the primary clarifiers, and we can have steady state flow. Awesome, right? Life is good. Well, if we sit down and look at some of these calculations, because you got to aerate that, right? In the EQ tank, you got to keep it aerated. And if we look at, and we'll go through all the numbers, and these are very ballpark numbers, but if every drop of flow goes through there and you're aerating it, and then you're sending it, you're pumping it, not gravity, that led to about 31 grand a month in electrical costs, which turned into, what, 380 per year just because you didn't fix that valve, right? So this optimization isn't necessarily some modeling and, uh, and, and trials, it's kind of looking through things of why isn't this working and what effects is that happening on the process? So again, it's nice to have the benefit of an operations person and a process engineer and folks that know how to work with, with the, uh, the existing staff. Oh, there we go. So a little blown up for you there. The other thing with this facility is, is that they had some ammonia loading problems and we all know what nitrite lock is. So when nitrite, when in, we have incomplete nitrification and you get nitrite, it eats up chlorine like there's no tomorrow. And I think this happens around a lot of places that they don't catch. And so let's look at that chlorine usage here, right? 1,200 pounds. And, you know, you can see the secondary clarifier nitrite. It was pretty high. It's over on the other x-axis there, or y-axis on the right-hand side. So you can see that trends perfectly with the chlorine usage, that, that nitrite. So when you start seeing that, oh, wow, I, I, I used the heck out of the chlorine last night. I wonder why that was. Oh, well, probably just an anomaly. Well, it, there's something to it usually. And so once we got this figured out with this nitrite problem and our nitrification issues, and we got the nitrite down, remember we were at 1,200 on, our, on our, our feed? You can look there, 500 is pretty much the peak now. So by controlling that nitrite, which nobody ever checked for before, but we saw the demands and said, hey, maybe we ought to check for that. So another thing that it doesn't take a lot of the thought process to know what's happening, it's just a matter of investigating a little bit. Here's just another graph kind of showing us some of the nitrite effect on the chlorine residual. You can see the, the blue lines are the usage of the chlorine. Um, you can see our total chlorine residual from the green is just dismal sometimes. And these poor guys, they had uh, they had to do this, they had to do the residuals by hand. They didn't have a they didn't have a con uh, controlling system. So it just compounded things for them. Uh, so Also, the BOD trends, I'm not going to get into that, but I just wanted to kind of talk about some things that are changing in our industry as far as the way we think about things, especially as uh, DO control goes, uh, how it affects the biology. 
and some of the things that uh, you know need further investigation, and it's it's pretty exciting stuff. And with that, if there are any questions, I see the microphone there. Apologies if you've already covered this, but was there any concern when you took down to one blower as far as the SEFM and the minimum requirements to keep things suspended? Well, uh, that would be a question for the engineer and they definitely checked on to make sure that they had the adequate mixing as well as the DO because I, uh, I would think that, that that mixing had to be satisfied first before you start to see the, the DO. So yeah. I, can't, I can't answer it specifically no. to that, but. That's great, thank you. Yeah. For the plant that had switched to the low DO settings, Yes. Did they have any uh, issues with like DOD removal and TSS uh, while the change was happening? Because you said it ended up being beneficial over time, but during that transition period where the population was transitioning, what was the outcome? Was the effluent totally fine the entire time or yeah, it's a was good there question. scary situations? So uh, to, to my knowledge, there were no scary situations, but that's something to be anticipated because like we were saying, you know, these rates will change, but it you know might take two or three SRTs, and if you're running a five day SRT, that might be a few weeks, right? So, um, or even a higher SRT. But um, you know that's something that's closely monitored, and there weren't anything that got too crazy. But that's that's definitely a consideration to make, and maybe you know you go a little less drastic. <laughs> but I think with the, with the aid of the modeling it kind of gave them a good idea what to expect as far as the water quality. If you remember that graph kind of showed the, the water quality uh, effects, but with, with that facility having anoxic zones, the, the BOD wasn't too much of a, of a, of a concern, you know? So in, in the TSS, to my knowledge, didn't, didn't prove any uh, scary incidences. Well, it looks like we're ending the day. All right. A couple minutes early. <laughs>